talk of this top end. We have Lorenzo Ruffoni. I keep wanting to explain a different vowel in your last name, but I have to check. <laughs> Lorenzo Ruffoni will be telling us about hyperbolization, cumulation, and application. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in this conference. So today I'm talking about these two constructions, the first two uh, words in my title, hyperbolization and cubulation. And I think at this point in the conference, people have a good guess for what I mean when I say cubulation, because uh, I have a cube complexes have appeared in a couple of talks, mini courses last week. So I'm talking about action on cut zero cube complexes. Uh, maybe people also have a guess for um, what I mean when I say hyperbolization, uh, but it's probably a bad guess. Um, so just want to throw there a warning that in my talk, words, words like hyperbolic and hyperbolization typically do not mean what you think they mean. Uh, they can mean like real hyperbolic, which is great. Uh, maybe gram of hyperbolic, that's fine. Kite minus one, fine. But sometimes they also will mean cut zero, uh, which is disgusting, but I didn't make the terminology. So I'm just worrying that the terminology may be a little bit off. So feel free to stop me at any point uh, if things get confusing. Uh, or more generally, I, I love getting questions. So let me know if there's any question. Uh, so this is the theorem I want to talk about today. And everything I'm talking about is joint work with Jean Lafont. So um, we start with a K. K is a, a finite simplicial complex. And I'm going to do something to K that I will define for you in a second. This is called a strict hyperbolization of K, the space that I will denote uh, just for the sake of the, type, uh, the first theorem as H of K. And, uh, and this, the statement is that uh, the fundamental group of H of K is uh, virtually special. So virtually special, of course, in the sense of Haglund and Wise. Okay, so just for, for, the, for the statement here, the only thing I need you to know for the moment about strict hyperbolization of K is that this is a locally cut minus one space. Otherwise, don't use the word, it's fancy. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. This is a locally cut minus one, thank you. Locally cut minus one uh, space. So this group here is of course uh, hyperbolic. This is like not something we prove. This is just something that the construction does for you. The construction gives you something with hyperbolic fundamental group, even cut minus one fundamental group. Uh, so what we prove is virtual specialness for, for these hyperbolic groups. Um, okay, let me put the statement, in, the statement into context for you before we go into, uh, into details. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is this warning that K is not the same thing as H of K. So here I'm using hyperbolization, not in the sense of low dimensional geometry. This hyperbolization is not like a uniformization of a real surface. It's not a, a hyperbolization of a three manifold. I'm not putting a hyperbolic structure on a given topological input. I'm drastically changing the topological input K into something uh, new. And actually this construction has been used in the literature to construct things that have some kind of weird, uh, weird geometry. Uh, weird to be defined at some point in the talk, uh, but for the moment it means it's not something that you get from nine to 11 on a Wednesday morning. It's not like real hyperbolic, complex hyperbolic, not that kind of hyperbolic geometry. So these are procedures that are used to create something that's different from, from things you get from Lie theory, essentially. Okay, so it's the, that's, the, that's the first thing. And, and uh, as geometric group theorists, if you have something that creates negatively curved things that are weird, you might want to ask, well, is this something you can use to construct non residually finite hyperbolic groups? Uh, this is saying no in a very strong sense. Okay, so virtually special, even if you don't think about that very much, you've heard several times this week that this implies that these groups are subgroups of some SLN Z, and therefore they are in particular residually finite. Okay, so no, 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 no interesting groups from, from that perspective. All these groups are residually finite. Um, so yeah, one point of view of the talk uh, is these are interesting uh, subgroups of S and Z with some geometry, just to fit in the theme of the of the of the workshop. Did I destroy something? No. Okay. Um, the second thing I wanted to say in terms of context is that uh, here I, I told you I'm changing the topology of K very much when I'm doing this operation, but I'm sending manifolds to manifolds. So if you give me a manifold, the construction will give you a manifold, and so this result fits. Uh, in a, in a list of other results where you have um, negatively curved manifolds uh, with special or virtually special uh, fundamental group. So for instance, of course, we all know and love the story about surfaces, um, three manifolds. We know all the people that go inside this list here. 
uh, uh, more generally, um, more in higher dimension, things like arithmetic lattices of simplest type. So these are the ones that you construct from quadratic forms on number field. Uh, in the isometry group of the real hyperbolic space, these are virtually special. This is a result of Aglund and Wise in 2012. Um, and then some less, um, maybe known uh, results. So I want to advertise maybe these results about Gromov, Thurston manifolds. So these are uh, manifolds that are negatively curved. They have Riemannian metrics of negative curvature. Uh, they are obtained as branch covers of certain real hyperbolic manifolds but they probably do not have real hyperbolic structures, like exotic negative curvature. Bergeron. Bergeron, yes. Thanks. Um, so these maybe were among the first examples of negatively curved manifolds that are not real hyperbolic, and Jihal proved that uh, their fundamental groups are also uh, virtually special. This is in 17. Um, and then I also want to mention this result of the recent paper by Avramidi, Okun and Shrivi from this year. Uh, Kevin is in the audience. Uh, they use some construction that is very much related to the circular visualization we talked about to get manifolds that also have virtually special fundamental group. And they actually use that to construct examples of manifolds that do not fiber in the, the in our dimension fiber seven. Okay, so that's kind of the, the context for, for this result. Um, that's going to be my outline for today. That's what the numbers are supposed to represent. And so I'm going to start by talking about hyperbolization procedures. And I want to assume that people know what that is. So I'm going to give you some definitions and examples for that. And then I, I will try to tell you some applications, some classical applications of these procedures, essentially what this weird geometry here stands for. What kind of weirdness can you realize with hyperbolization? And then I want to talk in the second, in the final part of my talk about how we how we get this, this construction here. So what is the cut zero cube complex that you use to, to get uh, virtual specialness? Okay, so uh, hyperbolization procedures. There is a class of procedures that go under this name and they all work in the following way. You start with some uh, combinatorial complex that is typically a simplicial or cubical uh, complex. You do something to it and you obtain a space which is uh, a metric uh, cell complex. And here by cell complex, I mean, maybe you could subdivide to get it simply or cubical, but that's not the interesting combinatorial structure on, on that complex. And, and you do that by, um, let's say, you can think of different procedures that do something like that. And then we call them hyperbolization procedures if they satisfy the axioms that I'm about to write down. And then there are many different procedures that do satisfy those axioms. So there's, a, there's an array of procedures that one can uh, choose from to do applications that are interesting for, for, for what you're interested in. So it's a procedure that looks like that, uh, satisfying. So I'm gonna write the stinky axiom first. The stinky axiom here is that H of K uh, is locally cut zero. Okay, again, this is some terminology that Gromov made up. I'm not gonna change it. Uh, you want the out, out, uh, output of your procedure to be at least a locally cut zero space. That's what you call a hyperbolization procedure. Uh, if you want something that is truly hyperbolic, am I allowed to use blue or blue is also bad? Ah, okay, so if you <laughs> if you want cat minus one, this is what people call strict a strict hyperbolization procedure. So I guess it's a French friendly kind of um, mathematics. Like if you want things to be negative, you need to say strictly uh, strictly negative. Uh, okay, so that's the first requirement. Uh, the second requirement is that you want some sort of consistency. Um, in your construction. So here, if I'm saying that I want a cubicle, so simplicial complex, it, it's something that comes with subcomplexes. It's not just a topological space. It comes with a combinatorial structure. So if I have a subcomplex of my complex, then I want the hyperbolization of my subcomplex to be uh, inside the hyperbolization of my complex as a, as a subspace. So there should be consistency on low dimensional skeleton, for instance. Many procedures are defined by induction on, on, the, on the lower dimensional skeleton. Uh, third axiom is that you want some something nice happening at the local level. So um, if if sigma in K is an n cell, so an n simplex or an n cube, for instance, 
then you want h of sigma uh, to be an n manifold uh, with boundary. And so that's that's the main thing to think about when you're thinking a hyperbolization procedure. You're turning cells in your complex into certain manifolds with boundary. And what manifold with boundary you choose is going to define the procedure for you. And I'm going to give you examples of that. Um, for, oh, and also the condition that the link of sigma in the original complex should be PL isomorphic to the link of this H of sigma in H of K, right? Uh, but the previous axiom, uh, if I have sigma inside K, H of sigma is inside H of K, and I want the links to, to look the same, maybe up to subdivision. So a, a consequence of this axiom number three is, for instance, that if K is a manifold, then H of K is also a manifold. Right, so here you should think K is maybe a triangulation of a manifold. And what I'm doing, I am uh, taking a copy of this manifold with boundary, one for each simplex, and I'm gluing them together in a pattern that's specified by K. So inside each cell, I'm a manifold, whether I'm a simplex or a manifold with boundary, the interior points are manifold points. And when these cells are coming together, if they're not coming together in a crazy way in K, they're not coming together in a crazy way after you hyperbolize. So you're not creating any branching or stuff like that. Fourth and last condition is something about the global topology. So here, number three is saying that the local topology is kind of preserved. Axiom 4 will say that the global topology is enriched. So here there is a map G. I, I want there to be a map G from the hyperbolized complex down to the regional complex. And I think of that as a D hyperbolization map. And so it's something that is undoing what hyperbolization does. And I want this uh, to be onto so a map which is onto on I1 and on homology groups. So I'm enriching the topology of my complex and enriching the topology of the complex, the procedure is able to achieve um, non-positive or negative curvature on the target. Okay, so maybe a comment on the metric here. There's no metric in two, three, or four. Let me add it here. So um, my procedure is defined by this H of sigma. This H of sigma comes with a specific metric. And so that's part of, of the definition. You you. You choose this H of sigma, it's a manifold with boundary with a certain geometric structure. And then you start piecing together those geometric structures in a pattern specified by K. And then the, the geometry on the, on the complex is the path metric that you get by those piecewise metric, that metrics. Any questions about the axioms before I give examples? Yeah, so I want my map G. This is a continuous map from this space to this space. I want the map induced on fundamental groups to be surjective and the map induced on homology groups to be surjective. Thank you. Okay, so even if you've never heard of hyperbolization procedures before, there is something you all know that kind of behaves like that and that's called barycentric subdivision. So let me give that example. And um, I'm lying, so I expect complaints, but I think this is something, something helpful to, to keep in mind. So barycentric subdivision. So barycentric subdivision is something that usually you, you think of as being an say in situ procedure, like you have your, your simplex or your cell and you think about going inside your simplex and drawing some kind of uh, configurations, picking up all the barycenters for, uh, for the faces and connecting them in a certain way. But a different way of doing barycentric subdivision is to have your simplex over here. You leave your house, you go into the bakery, you ask the baker to cook up for you some uh, barycentrically subdivided simplices, pick a basket of them, you bring them home. And then here you have your simplicial complex. You start removing all the simplices and you glue in the uh, barycentrically subdivided simplices that you got from the bakery, right? That's the way to do barycentric subdivision. That's a way of replacing cells with something else, which is something you can do. Uh, well, this is not going to uh, do anything with the subcomplexes. This is not um, changing the topology of my complex. Actually, my complex is gonna be homeomorphic to, to what I have. And of course, this map is even an isomorphism on, on fundamental groups. So, uh, okay, this is a lie, right? This is not gonna give you something at zero. If you input a triangulation of a sphere, you're still gonna get a triangulation of a sphere. So this will be a hyperbolization procedure if you restrict to the class of simplicial complexes that have non-positive curvature. Okay, <laughs> very good. Um, but for instance, you achieve something, uh, it's not geometric, but combinatorial. If you do barycentric subdivision on a graph, your graph will be bipartite. 
So you improve the combinatorics of the graph. If you do barycentric subdivision on a simplicial complex or any cell complex, you get a foldable complex. That's a complex that has a map down to a standard uh, simplex by labeling the cells uh, with the dimension. Okay, so you improve somehow the, the combinatorics of the complex. Okay, not a great example. Let's move on to another one. This is called Gramov's uh, cylinder construction. Uh, this is from 87, and this is not strict. Okay, so this procedure takes an input a simplicial complex, a uh, finite simplicial, and outputs uh, something I'm going to call fancy G for fancy Gramov. Uh, this is a non-positively non curved foldable uh, cubicle complex. Cube complex. So how does this work? Uh, this procedure is defined inductively on cells. So on vertices, I'm not going to do anything. On edges, I'm going to do barycentric subdivision. Right? And then I'm going to tell you what to do in dimension two. And, and that's the, the kind of picture that I can draw. So I'm just going to place two by n for higher dimension. So in dimension two, you do the following. So I'm going to define for you what is uh, the hyperbolization of a two cell. So I'm looking for every succion here. I'm going to tell you, if you take a two simplex in your complex, what is the object you use to replace that? So the construction is as follows. You take the boundary of your triangle. So it's just the boundary of your triangle. This is one dimension now. You know how to do hyperbolization have Ramo construction. That's so just a bicentric subdivision. You might trust that with an interval. It's times one one. Okay, so then something you're going to do is to close it out and make a mapping for us. Not mapping for it. You're not going to get many for the boundary. If you do that, we still have to close it out, but not, not identify both boundary points together, just identify the top of the boundary. So let's say that this piece is going to be identified with this piece. And take my dance to the boundary. Up the boundary here, the top of the boundary here that is not identified. Logically here, logically here, if you were doing mapping for us, you would get what you call well, it's ours in this case, but um, but um, it is a one. This is basically what you're mapping for us, mapping for us, and then you have the you have the, you have the wedge uh, along the along the other of the fiber in your forest, in your forest, in everything, in everything. Like, up, up the wedge, you have the wedge on the half of the fiber. The boundary here, 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 the boundary the standard picture for that picture that has to be the same procedure. Any question? Any, any question on dimensional one? Yes. Yes. This one is not straight. This one, one of the structures you, you get, get here. here. You get here. So it's either subdivided. Um, so there's a uh, natural structure, uh, natural uh, complex over uh, here, over uh, here, and there's a lot of points uh, where, point where yeah. um, um, there's a less force where it's going to be not, not, not obviously, obviously, in the curve, in the curve. Um, um, so it's not guaranteed to be the higher end, or locally going to stop the higher end. Um, so going yeah. from here to higher dimension, yeah. this dimension yeah. space, two with n, there's nothing special about a two. This construction is done inductively on the also yeah. added down on these two. Uh, appropriate setting every dimension in every way. Um, um, the, the last example I want to give you is the one that we actually want to use in our theorem. This is called Charney uh, Davis hyperbolization, what is H on 95. And this is a strict procedure. Strict procedure. So the logic is going to be the same thing. Um, for I'm going to tell you what to do with the two-dimensional cell, and it's going to look like a genus one surface with boundary, just a geometric structure on that surface with boundary would be different. So this structure here inputs X, a foldable, non positively curved positive complex, and outputs X sub gamma. Uh, this is a locally at minus one and piecewise uh, real hyperbolic uh, complex. Sorry for all the abbreviations. This is locally cut minus one, piecewise real hyperbolic uh, <clears throat> complex. Uh, if you don't know how to put up foldable non positive curve cubicle complexes, just take your favorite simplicial complex and hit that with the fancy G construction. 
that will give you a complex that you can then input into the hyperbolization procedure. So here the, um, the hyperbolization for a square. So square two is my notation for the square. Um, so what is the hyperbolization of that? Is the, the following surface with boundary that you can obtain in the following way. You start with a surface of genus two. Um, I'm gonna use some colors, but I'm not writing. I'm just marking edges. Uh, suppose you can cook up a surface of genus two with a hyperbolic metric that has two orthogonal geodesics. So these are simple closed geodesics and they meet at one point uh, orthogonally. Uh, to do that, you just draw some right angle pentagons. In dimension two, this is not very hard. Uh, well, suppose you have one and then you cut along red and you cut along blue, you cut it open, cut it open along curves and you get a surface of genus one with uh, a boundary that is like a single boundary component, but this boundary comes with a decomposition into geodesic arcs. It's piecewise geodesic, uh, and those are meeting at right angles. If you wanna see a picture of the universal cover of that, this is what I prepared over here. Um, this is this hyperbolizing cell delta two gamma, and this, is essentially a portion of this convex region in, in, in the hyperbolic plane, okay? Uh, notice that here, the boundary of this thing, the boundary here is actually isometric to the boundary of the standard Euclidean square. So it makes sense for me to take something like a, a cubulation of a sphere and then go in and um, remove all the two-dimensional faces and attach copies of attach copies of this, of this cell to all the things, okay? Uh, something different between those two procedures is that over here, you're always guaranteed to get something non-positively curved, whatever you're doing, because here, these links are large, these boundary links. Over here, uh, the links, the, the corners in your, in your boundary are the same as the corners in a square. So if you have a problem like a point of positive curvature here, that will remain a point of, sorry, a point, a point of not non-positive curvature point of also known as positive curvature, mm -hmm. uh, that will stay after hyperbolization. And that is why you need to input something that's already non-positively curved here, okay? Uh, so for the, for the higher dimensional one, you, you cannot just go remove two and write N. Uh, that, that's not the way it works when you want hyperbolic things, right? This works here because you can just take products of flat things with flat things and you get flat things of higher dimension. Uh, Bruno was telling us how difficult it is to get things that are negatively curved even if you just want real hyperbolic things in, in higher dimension. But that's what Charlie and Davis proved. Um, and here's the statement um, for every N at least two. Um, so you may have noticed that neither Charlie nor Davis is spelled with a gamma. So maybe you're wondering what is a gamma in the, in the construction here. And that's, that's the, the input they have for the procedure. There exists gamma, some lattice in SON1, some actually arithmetic lattice. Um, such that I'm going to be extremely sloppy on this one. Um, HN mod gamma looks like that. I'm not going to list all, the, all the, the, the properties of that. But what I mean is that there's a system of co-dimension one submanifolds, which are totally geodesic, totally geodesic. They meet orthogonally and the global intersection is just the point. So they actually look like that surface over there, but it's non trivial to construct that in higher dimension. Um, so they prove something like that exists, and then you do the same operation. You cut it open along these geodesics, these total geodesic sub, sub manifolds, and you get a, a hyperbolic manifold with boundary, where the boundary kind of looks like a cube in in a weak sense, right? It cannot look like a cube because a cube has flat faces, so it's not going to be like a cube. The boundaries will be totally geodesic sub surfaces, sub, sub manifolds uh, themselves with corners and and so on. Uh, but the post set of faces looks like the post set of faces for a cube. So it still makes sense to glue them in a cubical way. Okay. Wonder? Yeah. Um, if in the original X, you had you know, four squares meeting at a corner, what if in X to gamma, you also have four squares meeting at a corner? That's right. So why is it work with cat minus one? It's got zero. But it is cat minus one because the metric, thank you for the question. The metric in here is a hyperbolic metric. So if you have four squares coming together in a corner like that, you do have a piece of hyperbolic, uh, the hyperbolic plane here with a right angle, and they all look the same. So it actually looks like a very nice piece of the hyperbolic plane. It looks exactly like this, meet, this, this configuration here. Yeah, 
exactly. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, let me tell you what are some of the classical applications of um, this construction here. So the underlying claim is that if you take um, this fancy G or that gamma construction, they are hyperbolization procedures. They satisfy all these axioms that, that I wrote down. The composition also satisfies those action, axioms. So these are some classical, well, I guess, there are many classical applications and some of them are more recent. So uh, I don't wanna call all of them classical, but applications of this procedure where you start with some complex, uh, you hit that with the gram of construction and then you hyperbolize that with the Charney Davis construction, all of the following theorems are obtained essentially in this way, starting with a, with a simplicial complex that needs to be cooked up uh, properly. Uh, so the, the, the most classical one, this is due to Davis and Januskiewicz from 91. And this is the existence of N negatively curved uh, topological manifold. So here topological is to emphasize that this is not a Riemannian uh, metric. Uh, negatively curved topological manifold such that um, N tilde is not homeomorphic to uh, the Euclidean space. Right? Th this would not happen if the manifold was a Riemannian manifold of negative curvature. And, and you can even go crazier here. You can get something where the universal cover is Euclidean space, but the boundary infinity is not a sphere. You can even get those uh, tree of, trees of manifolds and spaces that Chris was talking about yesterday, like weird, uh, hyperbolic gram of boundaries at infinity. So there, there are variations of, of this. Um, two, this is a result of uh, Ontaneda uh, from 2020. And the statement here is that for any n, at least four, and for every epsilon, um, there is a manifold n, which is a closed, closed and Riemannian manifold, such that one, uh, the curvature, of n is in negative one, negative epsilon, negative one. And notice the quantifier in front of epsilon here. It's a universal quantifier. So this means that you can take these manifolds to be as close as you possibly can desire to be constant curvature negative one. So if you, if I ask you to make an example of that, this would be like a real hyperbolic manifold does that. Okay, great. But well, the second part of the statement is that this manifold n is not um, real hyperbolic actually is not more generally any locally symmetric. Uh, there's a real complex of quaternionic hyperbolic. These are not, um, these are not Kähler manifolds. And these are not these gromov thurston manifolds that I was talking about at the very beginning. So closed Riemannian manifolds of Riemannian negative curvature, which are not obtained by any other method previously uh, known. So- How do you distinguish them from Goldstone? Uh, Pontracking class. Uh, you can get these things we have. So you, you start with K triangulation of CPN as non triangle tracking classes. This procedure preserves the point tracking classes. So um, gram of Thurston and real hyperbolic have vanishing point tracking classes. That's what you use. And so this statement here is talking about manifolds that have some sort of negative curvature, but don't look real hyperbolic in, in a strong sense, like nothing that looks nothing that feels like a generalization of relative hyperbolic in the con con context of Riemannian geometry. Uh, also, I put down this, this result. This is a result of mine from last year. For any n at least five, there is a manifold. This is closed and smooth. Um, and here the condition is that pi one of n is hyperbolic, and I mean gram of hyperbolic here. There's no, there's no negatively curved metric on the manifolds here. And the condition two is that N um, is not an RPN manifold. So it doesn't have real projective um, structures, which is a different generalization of real hyperbolic geometry to a context that's not locally symmetric, but locally homogeneous. So like uh, geometric structures in the sense of uh, Erisman and Thurston. And there's many more, I just, I need to stop at some point. So I'm gonna stop here. Uh, the, the contribution, so the corollary of the main result that I wrote down at the beginning is that uh, in all of the above, in all of the above, uh, uh, you can take the fundamental group of these manifolds to be special. So in particular, is it to define it. Uh, so all these weird uh, behaviors are 
things that pass to covers. Like if you have something that does that, all the covers will do that. So this gives you a lot of manifolds with those, with those problems. Okay, I think I'm at the transition point in, in my outline. Any questions? Yeah. You can, let's talk about it later, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What, what inverse limit are you thinking about? Like, I don't know, just iterating and like, like, like thinking, you know, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You can do that. Um, you can get these uh, trees of manifold that Chris was talking about, for instance, like Pontragon sphere. That's the lowest interesting example. You can get a Pontragon sphere. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I guess I'm wondering about you know example number one, especially in the special, you know, the special instrument. I mean, how nasty is this? This one, the easiest one, you, you start with a, um, uh, the Poincaré sphere. You take a double suspension of that. So that happens to be S5, topologically S5, but the triangulation is nasty. And the nastiness of the triangulation is something that, like the links are nasty. So when you do hyperbolization, those links remain nasty. And so when you, uh, the, the gram of boundary is essentially an inverse limit of uh, visual spheres. And every time you hit those nasty links, you're picking up some nastiness. And that's what propagates out to infinity. How nasty was the answer? <laughs> okay, good, great. All right, so let me, Go back from part three to part two, three, I lost track, tribulation. So here I want to I wanna tell you more precisely what are the assumptions and the statements and the techniques in, uh, that we use in our theorem. So let me make the following standing assumption star. Uh, from now on, X is uh, compact, uh, non-positively curved, foldable. And again, if you don't know how to make that, take your favorite simplicial complex, apply Gramos construction, uh, Q complex. Um, and I'm also going to assume that the complex is homogeneous with no boundaries. So homogeneous, also known as pure. I mean, that every cube is contained in an n-dimensional cube and n is uniform all over the place. So like a manifold, a pseudo-manifold, an amalgam of manifolds and pseudo-manifolds does that. No boundary, I don't want three faces. I think none of these conditions are very essential, but let me just, let me just have them. Okay, so... Um, I want to, uh, so I have, I have this hyperbolization procedure that takes X to X gamma, my locally cut minus one um, space, which is something like that, uh, attaching all these hyperbolic manifolds with boundary to each other in the way specified by X. And I want to show that the fundamental group of this object acts on some cut zero cube complex. And ideally the, the action should be nice so you can trigger some results and get specialness from there. So maybe let's start with a very naive guess just to make sure that we're not missing things. So one of the axioms in the, in the list of, uh, of axioms was the existence of a dehyperbolization map, which would be something like here, pinch down all the genus you see down to the standard cube. Okay, that's what the hyperbolization map is doing. And the condition was that this thing should induce a map on pi one. Very good. I'm taking X to be non-positively curved. So of course, universal cover is a cut zero cube complex. I do have an action uh, over here. So that gives me an action of my hyperbolic group on a cut zero cube complex. Very good. This action is very bad. This action has huge stabilizers. This action over here is free. So everything in the kernel of this map will be in the point stabilizers. And it's like a chunky, normal, non-quasi-convex subgroup. But not nice. Ideally, I'm trying to achieve properness of the action. And this is like as far as possible from being a proper action. So let's do something different. So instead, look at X gamma tilde. Now, this is not a cut zero cube complex because X gamma is not a cube complex. But the thing I want to do is I want to look at this space with the kind of combinatorial structure that I have there. And I want to extract some cubical information, some cubical geometry from, from here. Uh, and find some cubical structure here. Okay, so the first word of warning maybe is to notice that this is not the same thing as X tilde gamma. So taking hyperbolization and taking universal covers don't commute because if I do X tilde, X tilde is gonna be simply connected, but then I do gamma, which means I'm gonna replace every cube with a chunky manifold. So that's very much not simply connected, okay? So this is not, this is not what this thing is. Um, so this thing here 
um, this is it is piled by copies of the universal cover of the Charney Davis manifold. So back to the picture here. I, I, I was hoping to have a nice picture on the board and we've been, we've been complaining about shock, but turns out the erasers are even worse. Um, but, but you know, when life gives you lemon, I try to shade everything in a way that maybe makes it uh, readable. So anyway, so this is my Charney Davis piece over here, um, my hyperbolic manifold with boundary. This is a picture of what it looks like if you leave to universal cover, right? This is a surface of genus one with bound boundary component. Uh, this boundary component here is a loop. You see this loop over here. And of course there's like infinitely many lifts of that loop uh, in the boundary of this convex piece. So the picture on the right is just take this thing and forget about the fact that it lives inside H2. That's what it looks like. It's some two dimensional domain with uh, infinitely many boundary components has a convex metric. Um, and all these intersections here are supposed to be uh, orthogonal and so on. So since my complex is obtained by gluing together pieces like that, the universal cover will be tied by pieces that look like that. So what I wanna do is to look at these and find cubical geometry uh, over there. So um, let, me, let me observe that here, th th these pieces over here, um, these come with, a very natural stratification of the boundary. Yeah, I could write something more precise, but I think a picture is more interesting. So there's like a, 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 a principal stratum, which is the, the top dimensional one. And then when you move off to the boundary, you can, you're gonna hit some of these hyperplanes. Those are co-dimension one. And then when two of them meet, you get something of co-dimension two. And you can define some sort of combinatorial structure uh, going down into the boundary. This is not a cell complex because the cells are not um, relatively compact, right? These, these things here, the, the closure is not compact, so it's not a cell complex in that sense. But see the, the way the, the way it looks from the combinatorial perspective is similar to a cell complex. So, uh, yes. So the Charlie Davis construction is from IT1. What if you start with the Nargent manifold of the type which you know is cubulated? Yeah, these are all cubulated. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah it does very much. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you how it helps. And if I have time, I'm also going to tell you why. Uh, I'm going to give you another theorem that maybe says just because you're, you're, just because you're obtained by gluing together arithmetic pieces, you shouldn't expect to be cubulated. Yeah. So, they didn't, they didn't have and, and many other things. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Okay, so let me give the let me give you the definition of uh, the dual cubical complex. Uh, I will denote by C X gamma tilde. So this is the complex in which vertices are uh, k cells, where the k cells are the k cells that I get from this uh, stratification structure. So for instance, the thing that I shaded with the eraser, this would be a two cell. Uh, things on the boundary here, this red piece uh, between those two intersections, this would be a one cell. Uh, and then th these points would be zero cells. So those are the cells that I'm picking up and I'm taking a vertex for each of them. So here is a vertex corresponding to the two cell. Here there's a vertex corresponding to the one cell. Here there's a vertex corresponding to the zero cell and another vertex corresponding to this other zero cell and so on all over the complex. Edges are co-dimension one inclusions. So for instance here, this red cell is included inside the two cell with codimension one. So I'm taking this edge. The zero cell uh, is inside the one cell with codimension one. I'm taking this cell. Uh, the zero cell is not contained in the two cell with codimension one. So I'm not taking that edge. But for instance, I'm taking this blue one cell is included with codimension one. So I'm taking that cell. Okay. It's, it's kind of a dual um, dual complex where I'm picking up only the co-dimension one inter uh, inclusions. And then cubes, uh, cubes as usual, which means that whenever you see a cube, uh, you're going to glue in that cubes. Like here I see the one skeleton of, the, of a two-dimensional cube, I'm going to fill in with a two-dimensional cube and the same in all higher dimensions, okay? Any questions on the definition of the, of the complex? Okay. Um, all right, so I can state the theorem now. 
to just rephrasing the initial theorem with all the hypotheses and stuff. So if X is as in star, so satisfying all these assumptions here, then um, one, this complex is uh, cap zero. And two, you have an action of the fundamental group. Well, the fundamental group acts on a universal cover and this kind of certification is invariant under that action. So the dual cubicle complex is also invariant under that action. So that's how you get an action on this cubical complex. Um, that looks good. Um, so words of warning here, this complex is not locally finite. That's not locally finite because these cells have infinitely many boundary components. So like here's a one component, here's another component, here's another component. Um, so that's something to be careful with. Uh, the action here is co-compact uh, by isometries. Uh, but also not proper, but it's not proper in a better way than the stupid action I was talking about over here. Here, stabilizers are uh, quasi-convex and virtually special. So that, that, that's where it helps, okay? Um, and so before I go into giving any sketch about the methods here, um, I wanna say that uh, well, this is a theorem of Groves and Manning from 18. And the theorem is that if you have G hyperbolic acting on Z, that zero uh, cube complex as in here. So you have an action that's co-compact by isometries and the stabilizers are quasi-convex and virtually special, then G is virtually special. Okay, so if the action was proper, one could use Eagle's result. When the action is not proper, if you can control the stabilizers, um, this is a, a result that does the same, uh, gives you the same conclusion. Let me sketch some of the tools that go into the proof of, of this one. Yeah. So, uh, so let me do two first. So here the stabilizer of a point of a vertex. Uh, this is essentially, essentially the way the complex is constructed is giving this to you kind of for free. This is the stabilizer of the dual cell. And so for instance, in on my board here, the stabilizer of this point uh, over here for the cubicle action is the same as the stabilizer of the entire domain here for the action by deck transformation. And so those identify with uh, fundamental groups of these hyperbolized, um, hyperbolizing cells that you have chosen. So maybe, maybe not the top dimensional one, maybe it's like lower dimensional faces of that. But these are all quasi-convex subgroup of the initial arithmetic lattice gamma that is special by Hagen and Wise. So back to Pierre's question, that's that's how knowing that gamma is special helps. Uh, okay. So for part one, uh, a main observation is that there is a function defined on on the on the complex with values in R, and this function is whatever extension of the following association. If I take a vertex, I'm going to send the vertex to the dimension of the dual set. So essentially the numbers I have over there are, are, are giving you this function. So the value of the function on this vertex is two because the dual cell has dimension two. This is a one dimensional cell, this is a zero dimensional cell. So I'm just keeping track of the dimension of the cells that my vertex vertices are dual to. And, and this happens to be a Morse function. And we know everything we need to know about Morse functions because of Cash's mini course last week. Um, this is unfortunately completely useless. Uh, because we know that having the Morse function is good if you can control the links. And I think I just told you that uh, links in this complex are, are kind of horrible. Like for instance, here there's a, there's a two dimensional cell. The descending link for this is all these one dimensional things. And this is not only not contractible, this is not even connected. There's infinitely many connected components, each of which is non-compact. It's like a, a terrible link. Morse, uh, but uh, links are said. I'm gonna do it on time. Um, so links are set, but you can still define them. So you can still define, you can still define uh, ascending links and descending links in the same way that you would do if you're doing more theory. So these, uh, these are all the cells <clears throat> whose height, who, who, who's this for which this function, this height function is one less or 
these are all the ones for which it's one more. And in this complex, this is very easy to, to describe. Like if I'm taking this one cell, the ascending link is gonna be all, this, all the cells that contain myself as a codimension one cell. And the descending one is gonna be all the cells that contains myself as a, uh, sorry, all the cells that I contain as a codimension one cell, okay? So um, you can go and check by hands that these complexes are, are flagged. So the ascending one, this complex is flagged uh, essentially because X is non-positively curved. So that's not too, too bad. Like when you're doing the ascending link, that's a very local kind of object. You're just looking around you, like what kind of higher dimensional cells you can walk into. That's a very local thing. The descending link, these are nastier because these are global statements. These are like, if you're a big chunky uh, cell, what are all the cells that you can possibly see in your boundary? And those are the ones that are not, uh, not, not even connected. So this one also happens to be flagged, but for a less stupid reason, this is flagged because um, the HN has some nice heli property. So essentially I'm saying that uh, a configuration of hyperplanes like this one in, in hyperbolic space where they are totally geodesic hyperplanes that meet at right angles satisfies a certain Halley property. So if, uh, if they have a collection of them and they pairwise intersect, then they all have to intersect. That's what gives you flagness. And once you know flagness for up and down, okay, that's not too hard to conclude flagness for, 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 the, um, for, the, final, for, the, for the entire link. Um, yeah. Oh, you didn't explain why um, the uh, the cell stabilizer quasi convex because in this action here, um, they're stabilizing convex subsets, uh, both in the action on the hyperbolic space. That's how you get them to be quasi convex in the lattice, and in the action on this universal cover. That's how you get them quasi convex in your group. Thanks. Let me a few words about. Um, it's supposed to stop at 12.30, right? Put, I mean, the, the entire thing ends, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop before that, but uh, maybe let me say a few words about how do you prove that this complex is uh, simply connected. Again, you cannot use Morse theory because, I mean, I, I don't know how to use Morse theory because links are not uh, decent enough to do that. So this is also something we do by, by hands. So let P be an edge loop in, uh, in this complex. So this is like a sequence of vertices. And every time you move from one vertex to another, your dual cell is going up in dimension by one or down in dimension by one. And I wanna prove that there's like a combinatorial homotopy down to a, to a trivial path, very straightforward. So two cases to distinguish. So case one is when P is con entirely contained inside a, a tile. So I mean, when P lives completely in a collection of cells, that's, that's the dual collection of cells to one of these pieces that tile my, my complex. So for instance, it could be something that, let me start from the top dimensional vertex, goes down, down, up, down, up, and then up, something like that. Now in this case, observation is that these tiles have a unique vertex of maximal height. So you should think of them as being like uh, mountaintops. And so you can just flow your path using the height function, uh, pushing all the vertices up to the top dimensional okay. vertex. So it's an easy case, so use H, to push up to the top. Uh, case two is the case in which P is not included in a tile. Um, and that's a tricky one. So here I'm looking at a path that, a path that maybe starts from a cell over here, goes up to the top, and then maybe comes down to another cell here and leaves and comes back. So the only thing to do here is to try to cut your path into subpaths, into those maybe shortcuts. So you can make them small and contain inside other tiles and then do an induction argument on the length. Um, if, you, if, if you're leaving the tile, then you can think of maybe using the boundary of the tile to cut your path. So instead of going from here up and continue, maybe you shortcut along the boundary and you do the same thing outside. But the boundary of the tile is very much not convex. So when you're doing that, you are increasing length. So this is kind of fighting against a method that would uh, go by induction on length. So the, the idea is to, is to cut along nice subspaces of the universal cover and 
the educated guess is that you should look for hyperplanes or trying to do cubical geometry would like to have hyperplanes. But all the hyperplanes that were present in X, I destroyed them when I did hyperbolization because I removed all the cubes and I replaced them with hyperbolic manifolds and those don't, don't have obvious hyperplanes. So the idea is to define things that kind of behave like hyperplanes. We call them mirrors. Uh, this is what a mirror looks like. You start with a piece in the bound, the codimension one face in the boundary of, of your tile, and then you do a maximal extension of that thing that keeps it locally convex and locally separating. So that's where foldability comes in as a very important part in the, in the assumption, but I don't have time to go into that right now, but those are things that are totally, they're locally totally geodesic and go through codimension one phases of, of the tile. So you, you define them pretty much in the same way you define hyperplanes. Every time you meet a new cell, I'm telling you how to um, extend past that. What that um, Every time you meet a new tile, I'm telling you how to extend in the new tile and so on, as you would do for a hyperplane in a way that keeps it locally convex and locally separating. Now, my universal cover is cut minus one. So something locally convex inside something cut minus one is actually convex, that's great. Um, something locally separating inside something cut zero doesn't have to be separating. That's, that's something strange. Um, so here there's some, some harder work. So it's also true that these mirrors are separating, but this is uh, harder to check because local separation in cut zero doesn't imply global separation. There, again, foldability comes in. Um, but but that, that's the kind of uh, technology that goes into, into it. So you cut along nice subspaces of, of X gamma, these mirrors, uh, plus induction uh, on length, which would now works because you've chosen the right type of um, the right type of subspaces. And I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm not gonna write down uh, another statement, but I just wanna say that we have a relative uh, version of this result. And that's a situation in which we pretty much remanage the same ideas and get an action on a cubicle complex. We get an action of a relative hyperbolic group on that cubicle complex that is not relatively geometric in the sense that Daniel was describing um, in his talk on Monday. But it turns out that if your action is decent enough, you can talk to Daniel and Jason and ask them, well, can you still get residual finiteness? And most likely they can, and they're gonna write an appendix for your paper. So that's a good idea if, if you have something like that. All right, thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. Yeah. First, what exactly does it mean to be locally separating? Thank you. Locally separating is the most naive definition that you can think of. Uh, it means that for every point, there's an open neighborhood. So a, a subspace Z in a space X is locally separating. If for every point on Z, there's an open neighborhood in X such that uh, U minus Z is not connected. Okay. Yeah. Second, Second question. question. Uh -huh. The, the, the hyperbolization on the fundamental group. Do you know anything about the kernel? Uh, it's normal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not much more than that, depending on what you want to know about. Maybe we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's bad. It's like when you, where's my picture? Like it's the surface of, you know, something you can map down to a trivial group. So potentially it contains the entire thing or to a lower genus surface. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, this is a variation on the question I'm wrong, but uh, uh, are there known examples of large dimensional hyperbolic quantum duality groups that do not contain high dimensional arithmetic lattices? Uh, I do not know that. The question? the question was, are there examples of higher dimensional um, hyperbolic groups, concrete duality, that do not contain arithmetic lattices. Poincare duality groups. That was the question? Yeah. yeah. Th that aren't built using number theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. some, some. What about the example? What about the systolic example? I, I don't know. I don't know the dimension of those. Huh? They have arbitrarily oh. high uh, homological dimensions. Uh, this is a. Uh, in, in, like, and, are, they, are they concrete duality? Yeah. It's not a concrete duality. Yeah, it's yeah. a good question. Yeah. yeah. What about Davies and Scott hyperbolic Davies and Scott? Yeah. I don't think I know this one. We can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's take Florence over again. Thank you.